Hello, lovelies. I am going to share with you a post by Cliff High that really caught my attention. Now, he talks about UFOs in this, and I don't know, I'm my jury's out on the whole UFO thing. But what he is doing is essentially applying a different lens to historical information. So this is the thing that hit me when I was working on the magic show in the very beginning is that trying to understand ancient Egypt without looking through a magical lens is a complete waste of time. And so the process of what he's doing here is looking at historical information through a UFO lens is actually a wonderful exercise. Now, regardless of what you think about the caliber information that he's delivering, The exercise itself is fascinating, and I'm very intrigued by the way that he approached this subject. However, I will add that he broaches a subject that for me (laughs) has been one of great mystery, and it has to do with the process of circumcision. Never really made much sense to me. (laughs) And so, I tell you what, this explanation makes a lot more sense to me. So, for context, what Cliff is talking about is the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And many of us have come to know yoga as a system of physical exercises focused on breathing, stretching, and postures. In fact, as you know, I was a yoga teacher. But what Cliff is doing is he is imploring us to reconsider this limited perspective. What Cliff believes is that the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are not a mere guide to physical well-being. He believes they go much deeper and he has a rather intriguing perspective. Cliff believes that the Yoga Sutras have been misinterpreted and misunderstood, that they really actually are a book of instructions on how to interact with mind-to-machine interface technology used by space alien conquerors who have influenced many of our civilizations over the past 12,000 years. Now, let's not necessarily dismiss this out of hand. I would say that if you're interested, Cliff has an audio, which I'll post below, and several blogs where he's actually done translations. And the whole thing is simply intriguing. So have a listen, my lovelies, and follow up with Cliff's blog posts and let me know what you think. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is a bunch of individual lines of instructions that if you read it as though it's talking about the mind-machine interface, it is directly talking about that. You can interpret it in a religious sense if you wanted to, in which it becomes very vague and less than focused. Well, what if it was not ever intended to be religious? But what if, in fact, the yoga is the union with the mind-machine interface and all of the descriptions of the Yoga Sutras are how to keep yourself safe and how to effectively interface with this device. And then what will happen A, if you screw up or if you're successful? Okay, if you read it that way, it's a straightforward tech manual. It says this is what you do. It is an instruction manual for this exact kind of a purpose. If you read it as a religious text, as I say, it becomes a little vague. I mean, it discusses meditation, but not in the way that uh, the great Zen masters discussed meditation when they were quite explicit about everything that would happen. And there was no ambiguity. It wasn't vague at all. It was precise, concrete, practical. All right. And so we see that in the Sanskrit literature, there's tons of practical literature about meditation. Right, very specific, very pointed, precise, what each aspect of your body does, and so on. These don't involve any vague word associations, okay? And so they're quite precise in the sense that they say, if you arrange to do this with your eyes, 
crossing your eyes this particular way and holding this particular kind of a vision in terms of how you hold your eyes relative to what you're seeing, then the following things will occur in your brain and in your mind. Okay, and so these following things that they're describing go to how to interface with these machines. Now, bear in mind that at the time that that these instructions were put down, the space aliens were telling us how to use their equipment. And because they needed more slaves, right? In my opinion, they came here in a depleted fashion. That is as though they had had a very long trip or had been harassed and had been worn down by some kind of an enemy on their way here. In any event though, they set these instructions down for humans and basically it's like, okay, here's how you drive our cars. Okay, you sit yourself down, you do this, you do that, you know, you put your foot on the brake before you push the start button, that kind of thing. Very precise, explicit, practical descriptions. Okay, some of these go, as I say, there's vast quantities of literature about meditation practices. Now, this literature describing the meditation practices in Sanskrit are not vague at all. Okay, they're not at all vague. They're not trying to do... Uh, word reassignment the way that we see in um, the commentaries on Patanjali Sutras or on other stuff. There's a lot of these books that are commentaries, okay? And so in the, in the Patanjali Sutras, which are part of a vast tradition of uh, descriptions and writings uh, that have been interpreted, in my opinion, wrongly as being directly focused on meditation for uh, enlightenment. And so, uh, if you're a meditator and you're way into this stuff, you see that you run into these ideas of, uh, that are described as samadhi, as moksha. Uh, basically, they're talking about enlightenment and so on. But if you look into the words themselves, you find that a lot of these words are very accurately applied to dealing with a mind-to-machine interface. So, the, there's a lot of descriptions about the idea of uh, moiksha or moksha, which is the idea of release. Okay, and so the meditators interpret this in a way that is not enlightenment. Okay, it is the release of your cares, your your striving, your the release of the um, the tension of being alive relative to this idea of seeking enlightenment. Okay, that's as I say, it gets really vague and all of that. But if you actually get into the, the literature in which these words appear and keep going further and further back and so on, you find these words being used, like where it says in some of these, uh, it says, if you achieve this mindset set with the machine uh, interface, then uh, this is how you get release from it. This is how you uh, release yourself. And this is important because these mind-to-machine interfaces are, and they're very deeply described in Sanskrit. I have found a whole treasure trove of um, material going into how these machines affect your mind and, and this kind of thing and what it is like as an experience to interact with these machines. So now, <coughs> these things are described as like um, mm, It's like swirly things that take over your mind. Okay, so so it's very appropriate, and there's even discussions in some Sanskrit and Pali uh, languages uh, about the um, the interaction at that level and and how it 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 is visually when you first interconnect, you're presented with a vortex, and then uh, visually, you get an impression of a vortex, but then when you get into it, you fall into the uh, the swirling bit, and they call that the maelstrom, okay? Uh, it's also described as the whirlpool, and the whirlpool exists at the center of the vortex, and once you connect to the uh, mind-machine interface, the point is to move your mind down to where it goes into the whirlpool, and that's where you can apply your mental energy to make things happen, okay, with the machine, levitation or whatever. And then there's lots and lots and lots of discussion on what to think, how to think it, 
such that these machines behave themselves. So you have to understand that the reason we think these instructions are for meditation is because so much of these instruction sets are going to the idea of internal mental control. But it's not internal mental control such that you have a happy life or that you become enlightened or something like this, right? Again, a very vague phrase. What is enlightenment? How does it affect your body? How does it affect your, your mind? How would you know if you were enlightened? Okay, so if you get into the language, you see that they're not talking really about that. And so it all goes to the idea of affecting the power of the machine through this interface with the power of your mind. And so it can be seen, obviously, that if you have a scattered mind, you're going to have real problems controlling these machineries. And so if you're, you're just cruising along, you finally get the Vaimana to, you know, which is a, it's a stone device, you know, massively heavy, 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 tons, five-story, you know, stone pyramid kind of like building, and it flies. And, uh, and you're the, the pilot there. Well, you connect with the machine, you go to the vortex, you decide which half of the vortex you're going to dive into the whirlpool from. And there's reasons to choose one over the other depending on what's going on. And then you get in there and you're in the whirlpool. So your mind has melded with this interface. That's when it becomes really fucking dangerous. Because if you start thinking of, you know, a Simpsons episode, who the fuck knows what's going to happen? Because that device doesn't understand the Simpsons episode, but because of the nature of that part of your mind that does the work interacting with the device, casual kind of um, uh, imaginings, fantasy, you know, musings, all of these kind of things can get your ass into real trouble. Okay, so you could see that if you were just randomly thinking about shit and, you know, happened to think about a video game you've been playing while you were driving the Vimana, well, that ain't going to do too well because you're not driving it with your hands. You're driving it with your mind through your body. <laughs> so, so things get real complicated here, right? And so not everybody was going to be a good Vimana driver. Lots of information or lots of warnings about the danger to the device and lots of warnings about the danger to individual people who should not attempt to do this. And then also warnings about nobody should attempt to do this without adequate training and that here's how you go about getting the training. Much of those books we've misinterpreted as manuals on meditative techniques. So, so there's a real kick in the pants. At some point, it'll come on out, all of the details here, but you will be astounded at how much of this stuff was just like staring us in the face. Man sees what he wants to see and disregards the rest. We have all kinds of language about the conditions and things that occur when you join to the machine so that you are prepared. And a lot of this, actually, when you uh, read, read it, you see that there are similar experiences in dealing with the whirlpool, dealing with the maelstrom, both of which are words that they actually use in ancient Sanskrit to describe the interaction of people with these devices. If you just read it directly, if you, if you take out any kind of commentary or any kind of translation that makes it go to meditation in a religious sense, then you see that it's actually techniques on how to harden your mind so that you can get up and control these devices and not crash the bugger into the ground. Also, I found a huge uh, repository of commands, okay? And there's a lot of fucking discussion, like big, dense volumes. Anyway, so we found these books that go to um, discussions about the rules of the operation. I've also found a lot of books within that tradition spread out over centuries, and these books have discussions at an academic level about the process of interacting with the machinery and why certain things work and why certain things don't and how to train your mind to actually make the connection without getting swallowed up and lost in it. And it just goes on and on and on. It's all very practical stuff. And it is as though we had a technical college somewhere that explored the machinery and stuff from a human viewpoint in order to make humans better at it. 
and they sussed out a lot of stuff that the space aliens didn't tell us directly when they introduced us to the machinery, probably because they didn't think it was pertinent to us. And all they wanted to do was to say, sit here, put your hand there, you know, put your foot on this before you push this button. Once you push this button, this happens, yada, 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 right? And so we see all of these kinds of discussions there. Within this body of discussions about the interaction of humans in these machinery, as I say, are all these cautions about people that should not be involved. So, you know, don't let a woman do it. And, you know, uh, don't let a woman under any circumstances interact with this ancillary part of the field. It's all about these field units and so on. But it also talks about you can't do this if you are a circumcised male. Or rather, it may be impossible for you as a circumcised male uh, if you were circumcised at a young enough age because it will have affected that part of your mind, easily identified that it's got names and so on, it will affect that part of your mind, the circumcision, because it affects your brain in terms of how it matures. And in fact, there are instructions to the space aliens saying, hey, if you want to keep your slaves under control, circumcise them. They won't be able to use this machinery. They can't escape. You know, because you can't leave the guns, you couldn't leave the magnetic bubble without knowing how to interact with the control unit. And so, so they were saying, you know, if you want to have maximum effect, you want to circumcise the child before they're 13. Maximum effect is circumcising shortly after birth. Or if you want to do this other operation shortly after birth, this works as well. But on some types of humans, it doesn't work as well as on others. And so we get this whole thing, right? And we, um, the circumcision aspect of it has to do with the hormones that come on the male body over time through maturation into puberty and that these pubescent hormones cause the maturation of this part of your mind that allows you to connect to these machines. If you don't have this part of your mind mature, you, at best you'll have a tentative bad connection, but uh, it will be bad for everybody because you won't have control, right? And so it'd be like you'd be, you, you know, you're you're old enough to get in the car and turn on the, the thing and grab the steering wheel, but you can't reach the brakes. Uh, that sort of a deal, right? So this is the kind of thing that they're saying you got to watch out for. These discussions go to the idea that certain kinds of wounds that would happen to men in battle would make it such that you're not a good candidate to operate these machines. And there's a long list of them. And so there's this list of cautions found in this manual of the command and control instructions of these devices that give you hints as, and not hints, I mean, they explicitly say, you know, uh, you don't want these kind of people using these things, right? So this is all quite complex, and we've only scratched the surface, and we've only done it in this one language. So some of these books are two and 3,000 pages long, and they may be fragmentary. Just as we know, there's a big introduction to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, that if you read the book as a technical manual for interacting with these machines, then you see that there's a big introduction that's missing, that we're looking at fragmentary material. We knew that the yoga material was fragmentary, but we didn't know how, uh, how much is missing because we weren't looking at it as a, a realistic subject. We were taking it in a religious bent. Now, it is my opinion that we take these things in the religious bent through the Kali Yuga because of the nature of the Kali Yuga and its effect on the human mind. Because we're so far from the emanations from the galactic center that we're in a denser, more stupid state, right? And so all of the people that do get into yoga, they know the what the word yoga means, okay? But they never think about it. And when they do think about it, they think about it in a religious bent. But the word yoga means union, okay? And so, a joining, a melding, a union, specifically a union. And it means union because we were unified, we were melded to those machines when you attached yourself. So, whatever the fuck happens to that machine happens to your mind and vice versa. And so, the machine can kill you just as you could kill the machine with your inappropriate mental musing, that sort of thing. If you do it wrong, the machine will kill you or it will mess your mind up forever. And thus, all of the cautions in this. This is not for, for kids. It's not a toy. 
But we took that word union and everybody says, oh, you know, union with the divine, union with God, you know, union with your deeper self or union with your soul and so on. And, you know, it's, it's bogus. It was right in front of our face and we never even saw it. It's all about union with the machine. It's all about the maelstrom, the whirlpool. And it is named that way specifically. So the space aliens in their, in their instructions to us call it the vortex. Further down in there, in some of the instructions, they acknowledge there's a split and there's, um, the vortexes can be seen from one direction or from another as you enter in these machines. It is at that point that when humans take over, they liken it to the whirlpool. And you'll see that word appearing occasionally when humans have written about the experience of using these devices. They don't call it the vortex or the toroid. They call it the whirlpool because that's the experience. That's the effect. When you plunge into it, it is literally a plunging. It is, it is as though you have a body and you're diving into a fantastically spinning whirlpool that will respond to you. And so if you're all freaked out, it's going to get freaked out. But if you're calm, if you've done these techniques, if you know how to control your mind, it's calm. It will obey you. And that's really the secret in plain sight relative to this. So it's good that we got people doing yoga, but they're doing it stretching themselves, stretching their bodies, but not understanding the reason that we were instructed to do this was its effect on our minds and the goal is to to work the mind to have union with these devices okay and of course the devices were seen as divine so across the centuries of decreasing emanations from galactic center as humans become born more and more dense with each generation as we're stupider for a long period of time for each with each generation we lose the sense of that connection to the machinery and just eliminate that in our language. And we just talk about being able to connect to the divine, the gods, right? And so, so it's a, a, you know, it's humans doing human shit, misunderstanding. More soon. Thank you for listening, lovelies. And I want to tell you about the Magical Egypt Summit that is coming up in September. At the Magical Egypt Summit, we are going operative. We are dedicated to pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible. We invite you to join us on this exciting journey as we explore new ways of thinking and being and challenge our preconceptions about ancient Egypt and the modern world around us. Our lineup of speakers and thought leaders is unparalleled, with experts from a diverse range of fields coming together to share their insights and knowledge from neuroscience to spirituality, from cutting-edge technology to ancient wisdom, we'll be exploring the latest breakthroughs and the deepest mysteries of the human experience. We invite you to actively participate, sharing your thoughts, posing questions, and immersing yourself in the profound wisdom of these exceptional minds. It is full of all my favorite people talking about fascinating subjects. So I invite you to come, and I hope you're excited as I am. You can find out more at MagicalEgypt.com.